So have you ever wondered who exactly made the first wine? Where and my goodness, what did it taste like? And also when we think about wine and uh, its history, its past, what does that have to tell us about the future of wine? They are very connected like so many other spheres. That's exactly what we're going to learn tonight on the Sunday Sipper Club. Hi, I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site at nataliemclean.com, and we gather here every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, that's Toronto, New York time, to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. Now, before I introduce my guest fully, in the comments below, I would love for you to post, where are you logging in from tonight? I get a real kick out of uh, finding out how many different people are here from different parts of the planet. Uh, I want to welcome Anne from Halifax. I'm glad you like the background. More on that later. Thank you. Linda White Alexander is here. Uh, Lois Gilbert is here. Colleen Kilty. This is terrific, folks. You all coming in nice and uh, quickly. Um, let me just go back here and give you some background on our guest, who is extremely interesting. All right. Our guest this evening is a former MIT Knight Science Journalism Fellow and former Associated Press Correspondent. He began investigating one particularly mysterious vineyard and then quickly found himself caught up in a viticultural detective story, complete with false leads, DNA evidence, and rare grapes hidden in remote valleys all around the world. And he joins me live now from his home, home in Florida. Florida. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Sunday, Sunday Super Club. Club. Kevin, Kevin Bagels. Bagels. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Natalie. How are you? Great to be with you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so, so much for joining, joining us. us. Your, uh, uh, your book, book sounds, sounds amazing, amazing and, and uh, lots, lots to talk, talk about, about tonight. tonight. And, and um, um, I want, I want to welcome, welcome Tom, Tom, who's joined, joined us. Uh, Jim is here, Francis, Francis and Beverly. Beverly. You, guys you guys are piling in, in nice and quickly, quickly tonight, 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 so thank you. you. Um, um, so, so let's, let's start, start off, uh, uh, Kevin. What sort, sort of triggered the idea, idea for this book? book? Honestly, it was a, an accident. I was in Amman, Jordan, which is not the place you think of for wine. And I was in my hotel room. I was reporting on a completely different story. And there was a little mini bar that had, you know, cheap liquor and probably fake liquor and things like that. And I never drank from a hotel room mini bar because I don't trust the wine um, or the, the liquor. But there was a bottle from a winery, Cremeson Winery in Bethlehem, and I'd never heard of it. And I looked at it and I thought, huh, there are monks making wine in Bethlehem in 2008. So I tried it and it was, you know, quite a nice wine, a very good, a little spicy, a little almost like a Syrah. Um, but, you know, I had a lot of other work to do. I came back to the U.S. I thought I'd just buy a bottle and share with friends and learn more. And that's what I learned. They had no U.S. distributor. You couldn't buy it. And, you know, when you can't have something you want. <laughs> um, not only that, it was very mysterious because I learned they were using all these grapes I'd never heard of, Hamdani and Jandali and Baladi. Okay. And I thought, you know, what are these? So it took a number of years, but... Uh, Slowly, I started to figure out what their story was. Okay, great. Wow. And, and so, so what, what did you do, did you do next, next to sort of pursue, pursue the idea of this book? book? Well, at first I looked for information about that one winery, and there was no information at all. Um, my favorite wine book, reference book, is the Oxford Companion to Wine. I think it's okay. a fabulous book. And Kermeson wasn't mentioned in it. None of the grapes were mentioned in it. It even said 10 years ago that there were no indigenous grapes, and Israel or that part of the world. Yep. So that kind of, you know, I thought maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe this is some wild goose chase. But then a few years later, Jancis Robinson and Jose Villamo published Wine Grapes, the great huge catalog of 1,300 and whatever it is, 63 grape varieties. Right. And they still weren't in there. So I still wondered, but then within about a year, they said, yes, we actually miss those grapes. They really do exist. They're native grapes of the Levant and the Holy Grail. And I uh, started to learn more about Kermesan. Okay. All right. So um, you've got a few stories for us. And I just wondered, uh, maybe uh, there's one about Goliath that you could tell us about? Sure. Um, 
I, of course, visited a lot of great vineyards, but I combined all my visits in different countries with visits to scientists and archaeological sites. So I was trying to understand what wine was like in the past, thousands of years ago. The people who invented it were the Egyptians, the Israelis, the early Christians, the Romans, the Greeks, um, the Hittites, even earlier than that. Uh, and I had a kind of revelation that a city called Goth in Israel, which was reputedly Goliath's hometown, and they found archaeological evidence to suggest it really was. And the archaeologist there, Aaron Mayer, said, he said, you know, the people in the past were exactly like us emotionally. Aside from all the technology and religion and changes, they still enjoyed things the way we do. They were afraid of things. They loved things. They hated things. So he made the point that they experienced food and wine in much the same way. You know, some things tasted good, some things tasted bad. People had favorites. There were premium wines and cheap wines for the masses. Then it was cheap wines for the slaves. But, you know, there were all sorts of different levels of wine. And that really kind of was an insight for me. It brought the past a little bit to life, realizing that emotionally people maybe haven't changed that much, even uh, as we've advanced technologically and learned so many new things. Oh, I love that, I love that story. story. Okay, okay, and I'm, I'm going, going to, to take, take a look at, at Facebook, Facebook um, because we've had lots of people pile in. And um, I've got uh, Rochelle O'Connor is here and Sue Yoakum and Andrea Shapiro is here. Now, let me see if I can click into this without creating an echo, folks. Um, let's see. There we go. Now, now I can, I can see. see. Oh, the, the echo's, echo's back. back. I hope I can eliminate it. Okay, okay so, so Joey Campanero is here, Robin Lewis, James Jameson, Neil Miller, Miller Beverly Asselon. Um, okay, okay so, so hopefully the echo's gone, gone, guys. Just let me know. Dave Head is here from Cookstown, Toby, Jim Ullery. Um, wow, you guys are just uh, coming in nice and strong here tonight. Jeffrey Mayo is here. Okay. So thanks, every, thanks everybody for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a very enthusiastic crowd and uh, they're always telling me when things are working technically. So I always try to balance that out. All right. So there's a few other stories I'd love to hear from you, Kevin, uh, before we uh, dig in with more of the, the questions that I had prepared. Um, you mentioned something about Aphrodite. Maybe you can tell us what uh, what that was all about. Aphrodite is actually the same as Venus. Uh, okay. It's just Aphrodite was the original goddess. Uh, the Romans changed her name to Venus. And, uh, you know, a lot of us probably seen the Botticelli or the Renaissance pictures of Aphrodite. She's in a shell, actually a scallop shell with long flowing hair. And the original myth was that she was born in the surf off Cyprus. And they still have temples to Aphrodite there, ruins there where they had created temples to honor her. But thousands of years ago, she was a much more, uh, and I guess this is usually the case, multi-dimensional woman. There was a warrior Aphrodite that some of the ship, some of the sailors carried with them, uh, who would sometimes, you know, supposedly bless them in, bar in battle. Um, uh, there was a temple Aphrodite. There were even some sort of polysexual Aphrodites who, for marriage ceremonies, where uh, in Cyprus, the men would dress up like women at certain marriage ceremonies. So it was a lot more fluid. Um, but I visited her temple, one of her temples there, the ruins of it. And you, it's right on the coast. You can still look right out on the Mediterranean, which Homer famously called the Wine Dark Sea. And you can actually imagine uh, being there. And that Aphrodite at her time, it might have been, mm, I'd say, the first girl's night out. Because women, <laughs> would get, women would gather together in what were called nymphaeums. We would call them little baths, with often surrounded by ferns and flowers. And it was kind of... Not only women, but mostly a woman-only place. And they would often drink wine together, um, you know, in this cool, relaxing place. And for certain times of the year, there were, there were religious festivals where the men really weren't allowed. It was totally just for the women. Huh. Wow. Okay. So, um, and did that make it at all into your book, or was that just... That's, that, that's in the book, uh, because uh, Cyprus is one of the earliest sites of winemaking uh, in the Mediterranean. Wine basically moved west from the Caucasus Mountains down through Israel and then across the Mediterranean, so Cyprus, Greece, Italy, France, 
France came last, believe it or not. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. They, <laughs> they'd like to think surprising. they came first. Yeah. yeah. I always thought they came first, too, but they were, <laughs> they were about five, 6,000 years behind the Caucasus. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> That's, That's great. great. Good, Good to, to know. know. So, so folks, if you're just, just joining us, us, we're here with Kevin Vagos, and his, his book is Tasting the Past. past. Um, and we're having a great conversation about the history and origins of wine. So if you are enjoying this video and our conversation, please take a moment to share it. And even better, uh, tell your followers why you're enjoying this uh, conversation, this video. And as you know, at the end of our chat tonight, I'll be drawing for a winner from last night's or sorry, last week's uh, conversation with Sue Ann Staff, and um, someone will be winning a pack of three of her wines. Tonight, if you share this video, uh, we will draw for a book, uh, for Kevin's book, um, which I, just sounds like a really exciting detective story. All right, so back to some of these um, stories and, and uh, notes here. Kevin, maybe you could tell me about the schlepping stones. Am I saying that correctly? Schlepping, not stepping? <laughs> schlepping is kind of a New York word for yes. <laughs> hauling things around, um, right. you know, lugging things around, like bunches of bags and things. I visited Jose Buyamo in Switzerland, and he's the co-author of the Wine Grapes book, which was a great, you know, encyclopedia book of over a thousand varieties. But they have a, a rare vineyard that they purchased, actually kind of a sanctuary for rare grapes that about 40 or 50 people got together to purchase just to preserve the grapes. But it's way up on the side of the mountain, and Jose didn't really tell me that. He invited <laughs> me to visit. And, uh, so I climbed all the way up the mountain with these very hardy, great Swiss people. But they were building the terraces. You know, you often see the stone terraces that all across the Mediterranean and really all across the world people use to create vineyards. So I helped building the terrace and it was a huge amount of work and they never show you that so often in the wine, you know, we always see the great pictures of beautiful grapes and the beautiful wines and everything's wonderful. But there was a lot of work too, just to build really in this one vineyard. And as I looked out over the Swiss Valley, this is in Southern Switzerland near the Matterhorn and all that, there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of terraces built over the, you know, last few hundred years. And I thought, good gosh, all that, you know, what it really took to build those uh, right. all over the world. It's, yeah. it's, it's slow. Yeah. And, and without all the modern, modern technology, technology, nothing, nothing. just yes. hands, hands, just hands and backs. backs. <laughs> yes. wow. wow. Okay. Right. We've still got lots of folks coming in from Tamara is here from, from uh, I think your end Nicole. of the world. Oh, yes, yes, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> that's where you're from. Kevin. And, and Marie Pierre Bilal uh, has, has joined us. us. Uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa Marie, Marie has joined. Philip Brown, Brown says hello. Elaine, Elaine Bruce, Bruce says wine history. history. This, this is uh, this is so interesting. Uh, she's, she's loving the conversation. conversation. John, John Ventra, Ventra is here. here. Colleen Kilty, Kilty, I hope, I hope you, you found, found the sound. sound. I think we are. Um, everyone else is, uh, or no one else has said that we're silent. We've got uh, echoes coming in and out, but I think we're good on audio overall. Um, all right, so. And what about Leonardo da Vinci as well, Kevin? Uh, I had several meetings set up in Italy, uh, and then one of them fell through. I was in Milan, and so I was looking for something to do that afternoon and just browsed around online, and I saw a notice for Leonardo's Vineyard. Huh. I thought, you know, what's that? And it turned out that right across the street from the church where he planted the Last Supper, he was given a plot of land and a vineyard partially in payment for that painting by the Duke of Milan. This was about 1490, 1495. Oh. And from his notebooks, we know that he really loved going to this vineyard. Uh, it's not clear there was a building there back then, but it was right across the street from the church where the Last Supper was painted. So he could literally work all day. And we know he worked for weeks and months and then go to this vineyard and relax. And he kept it his whole life, and he actually left it to one of his servants when he died in his will. But... The vineyard, of course, over time between the 1400s and by the early 1900s, it was almost gone. You know, Milan was all growing up. Then Allied bombing in World War II hit the area. So the grapes seemed to have vanished. Mm -hmm. Well, scientists got the idea of looking down through the earth where the grapes might have been because there were pictures from the early 1900s and seeing if there was any archaeological evidence. And the scientist I talked to was actually really skeptical in the beginning. She thought, no way we're going to find anything. Huh. 
<laughs> but they did find anything. They found little pieces of grapevine, uh, old dried grapevine. Then uh, they did a series of DNA analysis and amplifications of the DNA. And they actually refined to the point that they were able to identify the grape type uh, that was there, you know, growing as recently as the early 1900s. And now they've replanted it with that same grape, Malvasia uh, decandia aromatica, which was a grape also grown near uh, Leonardo's hometown in northern Italy. So they basically recreated the little plot of the grapevine there. And you can you get a sense of what his life was like. You yeah. can see the tower of the church peeking over the buildings nearby. Oh, wow. There, there seems, seems to be a return, return to, to ancient, ancient grapes and, and, and planting, planting lost varieties if they can, if the, if the DNA, DNA or the plant, plant material hasn't, hasn't been lost. Did, did, you, did you discover, discover that, that or find? That was happened? a big surprise to me. It started out, you know, for me looking for the one wine chromosome. But when the Wine Grapes book was published, I realized there were hundreds of native grapes all over the world that I'd never heard of, you know, in Greece and France and Italy and Cyprus and Israel and other countries too, Austria and Hungary, and even some Native American grapes I hadn't known about. So now more and more scientists are able to precisely identify some of these wines, but just as they did with Leonardo, they've now been able to find some of the DNA from grapes thousands of years on old, just like they can get little pieces of old human DNA from Neanderthals and things. The science has gotten so much better in the last just 10 or 15 years that you can find some tiny little piece of residue, even like this is a quevery. This is the way the Georgians made wine. Okay. We more, you probably saw pictures of amphora in National Geographic growing up yeah. on the bottom of the Mediterranean where the ships were carrying all this wine. Well, the Georgians made the same thing, a little bit different shape. But it's gotten to the point where seven or 8,000 year old pieces of pottery, they can analyze just the stain on the inside where the wine seeped into the pottery and determine whether it was wine or olive oil or what kind of spices it might have had with it. So the science is opening up these whole worlds of bringing these stories to life, you know, not just that it was old pottery and wine, but, yeah. you know, we know now that they, um, you know, use some of the biblical spices, myrrh and that kind of thing to flavor wine. And they used uh, 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 pine essence, retzina, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so amazing discoveries just by finding tiny little bits of basically the wine that was drunk thousands of years ago. Wow, that's fantastic. It's, it's kind of like CSI wine. CSI, yes, the, the TV show, the detective show where they everything's solved by forensics magically in 23 minutes or 42 minutes, something like that. And they're starting to use that same technology for wine now uh, to uh, DNA analysis and mass spectrometry and things to Wow, that is so great. Um, Dave Head says, uh, Laughing Stock Winery in BC is making amphora. Uh, Mike Welling has joined us, so is Jillian Daw Taylor. Stephen Andrews, Kevin, did you discover that flavors have changed a lot over time? That was a big surprise to me because, I mean, I grew up thinking of France and Italy as the whole wine universe. And I knew other countries had it, but I. I for many years thought that the French had kind of invented winemaking and they're great at it, don't get me wrong, but uh, <laughs> they definitely did not invent it. Um, but there was much greater diversity of flavors thousands of years ago. We basically refined and refined, or some would say monocultured, not just the wines, but the wild yeasts uh, down to just a few varieties. There's estimates now that you know, in mo not in a big city, but in a lot of stores, a lot of restaurants, you see five or six wines. You know, the Chardonnays, Merlot, Cabernet, Pinot, Riesling, maybe some Syrah. But about 20 wines dominate the world market. You know, vast majority of all production around the world. But really, there's, th there's thousands of wine grapes and all sorts of different native wild yeasts that give different flavors, too. So we've lost some of the, we actually have definitely lost some taste that existed in the past. Wow. And I think it was Kermit Lynch who said when he, uh, famous, famous uh, wine importer and agent in Berkeley, California, when he read your book and he quite liked it, um, he said he was surprised to learn from your book, Tasting the Past, that the evolution of wine could be coming to a stop or has. Uh, what, what does that mean? Well, oddly enough, of course, all of us or most of us love Pinot, the great French grapes. 
I'd never realized this until a few years ago as I was working on it, but by keeping them exactly the same, of course, you're reproducing grapes by cuttings. They're not planted from seeds. They basically kept, you know, exactly the same for 2,000 years. That's how, people, how long people have been taking it from cuttings. So all the vineyards around the world from these great French grapes are not being planted from seed. They're not cross-fertilization with other grapes. They're being planted from cutting. And that keeps the flavors almost exactly the, the same, same or the potential flavors, I should say. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't let the plant evolve to pests, to funguses, to things like that. I mean, just imagine if there was no immigration to the Americas. Well, you and I wouldn't be here, <laughs> for one. Mm -hmm. Or think of, think of all the foods that have crossed from, from different countries to one another. We've stopped that dead in its tracks with grapes. Just this focus on you know, the great grapes and keeping them exactly the way they are, that's okay, but they've been planted so much all over the world. You know, Australia, Chile, of course, Napa Valley, New York State. Um, and we're overlooking some of these native grapes. <laughs> wow. Okay. okay, and Tamara, Tamara says, says uh, we, love we love you, Kevin. Kevin. You're a great, great journalist. journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, he is. is. And if you, if you missed my intro of Kevin, he's an MIT night science uh, journalism fellow and a former Associated Press correspondent. He really has his chops. Um, and and Natalie, let me just, I, I, yes. I didn't, uh, maybe I didn't finish the story before, but okay. a couple of very good scientists about the question of stopping grapes from evolving. Yes, yeah. When, you, when you've stopped Pinot from evolving for 2,000 years, right. but the little leaf hoppers and the funguses and all of those sorts of creepy curly beasties and things, they're evolving and they're still trying to figure out ways to attack the grapes. So with some other things, especially the Irish potato famine, which in the 1840s wiped out all the potatoes in Ireland, it was because they suddenly became, you know, victim to one particular pathogen. So sometimes scientists are warning that that could happen to grapes because we're doing, we're making the same mistake, planting the same grapes everywhere over and over, but not letting them build up their natural defenses from, you know, other cross-pollination. Absolutely. And that, I don't know if that was what helped phylloxera spread, but that was the late 1800s. But this just has so many commonalities with not only in the plant world, I would think in the human world too, when we have these superbugs and... It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's, Ebola spreads easier because of airline travel and international travel. And, you know, uh, a wine pathogen could spread much easier these days because things move around so quickly and so much. Wow. Um, all right. So I, hopefully, I want, hopefully it never happens. But No, hopefully. My goodness. Um, I want to make sure we get a look at your book. I've been showing screenshots of it while you've been chatting. But if you have, yeah, I see there. There you are. If you can hold it right up to the camera, Kevin. Um, Tasting the Past. There it is. And the subtitle is The Science of Flavor and the Search for Wine's Origins. So, Search yes. for the origins of wine. Of wine. Okay, great. Fantastic. And is it, has it been published or is it just about to come out? June 12th is the official date. As oh you can goodness. see, the book, the book does exist. It really is in print, <laughs> but it goes on sale June 12th. This is news. We've got the scoop this time. <laughs> That's great. Hot off the presses, so to speak. Um, so Mike Welling says, don't worry, human creativity will drive us further to experiment. Um, Stephen Andrews is asking, you talked about the DNA of wine, Kevin. Uh, will we see the Jurassic Park of wine? I, I, I don't know. That's interesting question because yeah. uh, one, a beer scientist actually, a, well, a yeast scientist, claimed to have ex ex extracted some viable DNA from a tens of millions of year old yeast sample. <clears throat> and there's some scientific debate whether, you know, it was really degraded over time. But they are able to extract DNA from certainly things thousands and tens of thousands of years old. So they're honing in on what some of the grapes may have. which was probably the way some of the ancient grapes were. Some They were still kind of figuring out, you know, what made the best wine. And the flavors might have been good one day, but terrible the next week. You know, so the Jurassic Park of wine would be interesting, but who knows what it would taste like. 
<laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, and you have another story about Nova Scotia and Dalhousie University. I'm particularly interested in that, having grown up near Halifax. Yeah, that ties into what oh, that, that ties into what we were talking about. Uh, can you hear? Do you hear that echo? Yes, yes I, I, I just, just heard, heard it cut in and out a little bit, but keep going. I can still hear you. Sometimes okay. Facebook does weird things, but we'll we'll just keep trying until we get feedback on the the post. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, there's a great scientist uh, in Nova Scotia, Sean Miles, uh, does DNA research, but he's also a wine lover. And he's experimented with Native American grapes and grapes of North America and finding a lot of great characteristics in their DNA, you know, unusual flavors, but also disease resistance, cold hardiness. So, you know, lot, uh, many parts of Canada are going to be able to grow grapes more and more in the coming decades. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, you never thought of Nova Scotia as having grapes, but it does now. Wow. That's, That's great. great. Good, Good to, to know. know. All, All right. right. So, um, one, uh, uh, the image is the same with the sound. Okay, okay. Hopefully, hopefully we're still, still broadcasting, broadcasting okay, okay folks here. here. Um, um, oh, Colleen, Colleen is asking, uh, where, where will, will the book be available in Canada? Canada? Is, is that, that going to be on most like Amazon, Amazon and it's, bookstores? Yes, it's definitely, it, it's definitely on Amazon. Okay. Um, um, uh, and, and, you know, almost any bookstore can order, order it from you. Sure. I'm told there's kind of a co-publisher in Canada. I think it some partnership they have with Algonquin Books. So right. any bookstore yeah. should be able to order it. Yeah, yeah. And, it's and it's so easy these days to, to, to order books online. online. So, But we'll post the link in Facebook um, after this and on the website so that you guys can or pre-order your copy and send Kevin right to the top of the uh, Amazon listing. <laughs> um, all right, so what I was, oh, oh, I wanted to give a shout out just while we're here. Um, John Stromberg has joined and there was, there was also, also Sandra, Sandra Buc Sandy Buchanan, Buchanan is, is here. Hopefully, Hopefully this is still going, going fine, fine, guys. Give us feedback if not. not. But, but if you're enjoying this uh, chat, chat, this, this video, video, please take a moment to share it. Um, as you know, at the end of our conversation tonight, I will be announcing a winner from last week's competition or contest, if you will. Uh, and they will, that person will be winning three bottles of Sue Ann Staff's wine. Um, and if you share tonight's video, especially if you let your friends know why you're enjoying this, um, you could win a copy of Kevin Bago's book, Tasting the Past. And I just want to welcome Melody Nobert has joined. Um, and Tamara says your book is available at Downtown Books. That sounds like maybe it's a Florida-based bookstore? Uh, that's a Florida bookstore. Okay. Yeah, books... Uh, a national book, store, book tour starts June 12th. I'll be in okay, okay. New York, Florida, San Francisco, wow. uh, Orlando, Tallahassee, a few other places, the Hudson Valley. Oh, Valley. I, thought, I, thought I thought book tours were over, over and it was all it's virtual, virtual these days, days but, but that's, that's great. great. Good for you. No, this is a real book tour. A real book tour. <laughs> okay. Um, have they added any Canadian cities yet? No, but I'm yeah. open. I'm definitely yeah. okay. open. Okay. Well, there you go. Maybe, Maybe we'll, we'll kickstart kick something, something tonight. tonight. <laughs> All right. So um, now tell me, uh, one, one reviewer of your book um, who quite enjoyed it, I think it was either Nature or Science Magazine, said, if you can, if you can tell Sauvignon Blanc from Semillon, you might feel that you, quote, no wine. But science journalist Kevin Bagos blows that idea to smithereens. How did you do that? Well, it, first I'll say there are a lot of people that know a lot more about wine than I do. You know, the... Jansen's Robinsons of the world, or Alice Firing, or a lot of great wine writers who've tasted many more wines than I have. But I essentially looked in different places. You know, I talked to the scientists, to the archaeologists, to paleobotanists, um, and directly to historians too, and visited all these historical sites. So I guess you'd say I came at it from a different angle uh, to try and, and start from scratch too. That's kind of the way I learned things: is you know, go back to the very beginning. Uh, and that was the Caucasus Mountains about 8,000 years ago. So I visited the Caucasus Mountains and a monastery there, Alaverde, that uh, has been making wine for at least 1,000 years and probably more like 1,500. Wow. And, and what, what were some of the, the myths that, that you dispelled about wine? Is, you've already talked about some of them, but maybe give us a, another one that kind of you were surprised about. You know, a lot of... Up until very recently, people have said that there were no native grapes in Israel and that winemaking just ceased after the Muslims 
took over much of the Middle East in about 636 AD. And, you know, it makes kind of sense when you think about it, because alcohol is forbidden under Islam. That turned out to be completely wrong. Uh, and the analogy I would say is, you know, marijuana was illegal in California in the 1960s and 70s, as was LSD. So if you made the assumption that because it was illegal, people weren't doing it, would it be accurate to say that nobody smoked marijuana in the 1960s and 70s? Right. <laughs> it turned out the Muslims had centuries and centuries, they had a whole genre of poetry called wine poetry, where people would essentially do what they knew wasn't, they shouldn't be doing, you know, it wasn't allowed. And they would compose these great poems about wonderful wine. And there were long books written in the medieval era by Muslims about exactly how to serve wine and the color of wine and, you know, your companion who served you the wine. So all throughout the Muslim world from literally 600 AD through the 1900s, uh, there were still Jews and Christians living in the Middle East, but there were also Muslims who just loved wine. And they were, and the Persians, the ancient Persians had a fa very funny saying. They said, well, you know, since it's a sin to drink wine, if you drink one little sip, you might as well drink the whole bottle. <laughs> because, you've sinned any, because you've sinned anyway, so. You're you done, know. so keep going. And, <laughs> and you know, you have to ask God's forgiveness anyway, so. Maybe we'll, we'll make it worth it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome Donald, Donald Price, Price and Chet, Chet Harrell and, and Melody Nobert. Um, and I one, yes, the, go ahead. The, the, big, the biggest surprise that really came out of left field for me, I mean, I think we all know the, world, the word terroir, and there's a lot of debate over exactly what it means, you know, is the certain flavors coming from the soil or not, and you now the, the pretty much latest assumption is from scientists and winemakers is it's a combination of not just the soil but the microbes and the grape itself because rocky flavors you know we often hear of a minerally wine well the minerals don't the flavor doesn't come up from the soil right just not the way grapes work so i kind of knew that and i think most good wine critics know that some of the latest research is some of those minerally flavors the flint flavors the, you know actually may be products from the yeast. The yeast is actually contributing flavors to the wine. It's not just right. contributing alcohol. We all knew that. The yeast right. makes the alcohol. Turns out the yeast actually makes specific flavors that, you know, I had always associated just with either the grape or the winemaker or the soil. You could, there was a great uh, test by the Australian Wine Research Institute mm -hmm. where they took three same white wines, made it the exact same winery. You know, they controlled everything. Uh, made by the same winemaker, same time, same vintage, and they used three completely different grease. They tasted completely differently. You know, whole new flavors from A to B to C. So terroir, we may have to expand to give the yeast some credit. Some more you know, credit. Everybody, everybody's been you know giving the soil and the winemaker and the grape the credit. Yeah. The yeast deserves some credit too. Awesome. awesome. And I have, I have a, question a question on, question on yeast, yeast, but. but uh, just, uh, just to, to go, go back, back to, your to your earlier, earlier point, point before you started, started on the discussion of yeast, I've, I've always wondered about that. that. Like, like, well, well kind, kind of thought, thought how can minerals, a, a non-organic, non like, like minerals, minerals get, get up, up into, into the, the vine, vine, which is an organic, organic living plant. plant? You can't yeah. translate they, yeah, the minerality right. into the wine. I mean, they're drainage factors, but really, whether you're talking volcanic soil. It's just a great story. You know, it's... You know, I love sommeliers, and I understand the challenge of, you know, introducing people to wine. And it's a very tempting story, you know, that yeah. this rocky Bordeaux or Burgundy place, you know, has just yeah. shale, and it brings the flavor right up, and it just doesn't. Right. I mean, it doesn't. It's, scientists are absolutely clear on that. Yeah. But the interesting thing is scientists still haven't figured out exactly where all those flavors come from. Yeast, it's our suggestions. <laughs> but... You know, it may be that the grapes mimic flavors that we call, you know, iron or slate, because rocks don't even really have taste. I mean, I don't, I shouldn't probably admit this on live, but have you ever licked a rock? I have. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, have you tried? So then, yes, I have too. You know, this group. Because you get that wet stone. Yeah, you had to try yeah, one. Yeah, you, you have a tactile, you know, it has a feeling, but it doesn't really have a taste. Not really, no. Um, not as pronounced as, co as comes from some wines. So there's some very interesting process uh, yeah. coming from probably a combination of the yeast and the grape and the fermentation that yeah. is producing what we've come to call, 
as stone-like flavors. Stone and, like and it's not just something new that we've made up because there's a passage in Don Quixote written over 500 years ago oh, yeah. where Sancho Pizza, he comes and he, he's inspecting a cast of wine and everybody thinks he's just kind of a buffoon and he inspects and he says, oh, you know, there's a little bit of leather flavor and a little bit of iron flavor to the wine. And everybody says, oh, no, you're wrong. You know, you're just a bumbling <laughs> idiot. And then, of course, when the cask is drained, you know, days or weeks later, it turns out there was an old iron key in the cask and a leather thong to it, uh, so supposedly. Wow. But that tells me psychologically yeah. that now, of course, Cervantes may have made the whole story up, but generally novelists make things up that they've heard. Sure. So the idea that somebody could taste iron in a wine is at least 500 years old. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great, great story. story. And, and, you know, who knows, like, whether it's the molecular structure of wine mimicking the molecular structure of asparagus or whatever. But I've heard that. But also that grapes are osmotic in that, you know, if there's eucalypt, eucalyptus trees and they'll get the eucalyptus oil on the skins and who knows where all that comes and from. The other biggest thing about all these discussions about flavor is, you know, there are a number of scientists say flavor really happens here. Yes. It in doesn't memory. happen. It, it, it's a combination of our memories and how we process yeah. the information. And there's some pretty good research suggesting that the more you taste different wines, it kind of opens up your sensory perception. Yes. Maybe because, you know, our olds from 50 or 100 or 500,000 years ago is to be cautious about something new. You know, <laughs> is it good? Is it bad? But as we have a memory of something, it opens up passages. So it opens up memories, but then you're dealing with two things. I mean, I had this with my wine from Cremesan. I tried it in 2008. I couldn't try it for years later. And I want ask myself, you know, what am I remembering? Is my memory accurate? Huh. You know, I tell you what it tastes like now, but am I really accurately remembering what it was 2008? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, you know, you know and I've, I've been, been in wine, wine tasting classes where someone, someone will say, say well, well, this, this smells, smells like the like Dallas, Dallas airport. airport. And we're, and we're tasting Rieslings, Rieslings, which have a petrol smell. smell. Mm -hmm. or my, my son's, son's gerbil, gerbil cage, cage they're getting the yolk chips, chips off the shark it's, it's about memory and that's, that's going, going right, right back, back to proust madeleine, madeleine you know exactly uh, and yeah. different people have different taste buds you know that's one thing i really wish you know we all did a better job with uh or just mention more is that people are different i mean we all know that people like different types of music yeah. and they like different types of food you know, you don't have to like the same wine somebody, somebody else likes. I mean, somebody can just absolutely love Pinot and somebody else can like Zinisteri or Hamdali or, you know, Tanat or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I would never, would you ever criticize someone who likes sushi more than Italian food? Right. No. It's apples and oranges. And there's a, have you ever heard of Tim Hanai in California? Hanai mm -hmm. or Hanai? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he gets into the vino types, the types of, and you know, not slamming people who love sweet wines, because that was traditional um, back in Bordeaux. I'm going down a rabbit hole. Back to your book. Yes. <laughs> um, so I want to welcome Philip Roy and Lauren Mackin, who are here. Um, great guys, I'm glad you can all keep. Um, Seeing and here. So, so what was the oldest grape fossil ever found, Kevin? About 65 million years ago. Wow. 65 million years. Okay. And, and uh, believe it or not, they found it in India, which at that time was still kind of floating off. It was an island unto itself. Um, it had eventually smushed up into Asia and, you know, joined the continent there. But uh, they even think that grapes are probably older than that based on some DNA genotyping, so they might be 90 to 100, even 110 million years old, but they haven't found those those grapes yet. But that 65 million year old one, it probably survived the big asteroid. It, you know, they were probably around right after or right before the huge asteroid that wiped out a lot of the ants, the dinosaurs. Um, and there's some, you know, good research suggesting that in that time, you know, after the Earth was decimated, little little things like vines, smaller trees did a lot better than, than big things and smaller animals. That's why birds survived. You know, the only living dinosaurs are really birds. They're descendants of dinosaurs. And it's probably because, you know, it was a lot easier for a little bird, dinosaur type bird to survive somehow than it was for a brontosaurus. Wow, fascinating. And, and I, I meant, to, speaking of little, little things, things, I meant to ask, ask you this question, question about, about yeast. yeast. 
What is the um, yeast that lives symbiotically with wasps that you discovered in your book, Tasting with the Past? Well, it was a, it was researchers who actually discovered it, so I just okay. saw their found their paper. <laughs> sure. But it was Italian researchers who were, you know, doing analysis of yeast on grapes and yeast in the wild and some vineyards. But they were a little puzzled because, um, you know, they were wondering what happens during the winter. I mean, it's easy to find yeast on grapes right around harvest time. You know, the the population seemed to go up, you know, when the grapes are bursting. But the question is, how do the yeast get there? You know, you know they don't have feet. You know, you know they, they don't fly. fly. They don't move around. It turns out the yeast had adapted. Some species of yeast had adapted to where one fall, you know, as the grapes are, uh, you know, ripening. Wasps will, of course, come to vineyards sometimes, and if a grape has a broken skin, you know, they'll get some of the the juice and the, the nectar. Well, some of the yeast lives in the wasp bellies over the winter, oh. passed on to another offspring in the spring, and then they transfer it again to the vineyard that spring or that fall. Helps it survive the winter because the wasps kind of, you know, go into hibernation or even is passed along to next generations of wasps. So it's just showing, and there's another great story about some, uh, I think it was French yeast. I can't remember whether they're French or Italian. Some European yeast showed up all the way in Australia, and they probably hitched a ride on the oak slats or barrels that were being imported into Australia for the wine industry. They were, in the early days, they were buying the barrels from France, but their yeast, they're native to certain oak barrels, and yeast, they're native to oak trees. So some hitched a ride, the European yeast hits the ride to Australia. Wow, fascinating. I love all these tie-ins and new discoveries that you're bringing to light, at least to the to the more general reading public as well, opposed you, to just I, I, I wish I had sent you the picture, but scientists, when they analyze DNA, like think of humans or Neanderthals, if you look in the distant past groups, think of circles, like there's Neanderthals here and Denisovians here and Homo erectus here or Homo sapiens there. You can see the DNA clusters and you can kind of see where, you know, people made it in the past. A really weird thing is that about eight or 9,000 years ago, just when people were starting to make beer and wine, the yeast, the beer yeast and the wine yeast and the bread yeast started to separate into different tribes. Oh, wow. So the wine yeast started to follow the wine, and the beer yeast started to follow the beer, and the bread yeast started to follow, started to follow the bread, and they slowly, you know, had some distinct characteristics, and they split over up over time. So probably 20,000 years ago, there were just wild yeast everywhere. Right, right. But as we started domesticating these things, and both beer making, wine making, agriculture, bread making, yeah. the yeast really learned to hitch a ride with us and, you know, follow <laughs> along. And, some people say the yeast are really in charge of everything, and we're really <laughs> just doing all the work to keep uh -huh. them happy. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. A yeast, a yeast conspiracy, conspiracy takeover. takeover. <laughs> That's, That's great. great. Um, um, so so uh, what would you say, like, like if, um, um, I mean, you're so deep, deep into the history, history of wine, of what, what do you think, think that the history of wine and what you've been, been researching and tasting, tasting the past has, has to tell us about the future of wine? Well, it's interesting. With all this technology, uh, there's tremendous advances. I visited a vineyard in Bordeaux, smith Hot Lafitte, very good mm -hmm. vineyard. They actually have an optical scanner that scans every grape to look for imperfections and discards them. They check for harvest by satellite because you can see uh, the ripeness of the different grapes by, you know, some of the compounds they, uh, they exude. So they're using satellites, they're using optical scanners, they're using computers, but they're still making, of course, traditional French wine. But it's, you know, with all this technology, you know, I mentioned before the Quevery, uh, Georgian wine is, you know, one of the greatest things now that people are rediscovering in America. You know, a lot more of it is available the last five or ten years, thanks to Alice Firing and other people. Um, so even with all this technology, the old methods still work very, very well. You know, Jamie Good, a tremendous uh, British uh, wine writer and a former scientist, actually, Mm -hmm. he, said, he said to me, and I had this suspicion, I asked him, you know, do you really need all this technology to make great wine? Not necessarily. I mean, it's, it sometimes makes it easier. It helps the yields. It, it, it definitely helps quality control. But you can still use an old clay, con, you know, just a clay container that was being the same type that was being used 8,000 years ago and wild yeast and just pure grape juice, nothing whatsoever else added, 
and still make a wonderful wine today if you're a very careful winemaker. Right. You know. Wow. So yeah. two things seem to be happening. I think there's tremendous pressures to use this new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even one company that's trying to create a quote unquote wine that doesn't use grapes. They're basically using chemical compounds to flavor alcohol and water. Wow. You know, so there's risks and you know, there's some dangers. Kermit Lynch was shocked by that. You know, that there's a lot of a lot of you know, a lot of wines have additives to them to make the color look better or, you know, the flavor up or down or different things. <laughs> so that's both in some cases helping profits, but also in other cases just driving people back to the traditional ways. Yes. So I think we're gonna see both in the future and a mixture of traditional and technology. Wow, wow. Way, way to bring it all together, together there, there, Kevin. <laughs> the, the past, past, the future, the technology, technology everything. everything. It's been, it's been fascinating. fascinating. So, so we've, we've talked about, about you, we can, maybe, maybe you can hold your book up there, there one more time. time. You can, uh, it's, it's coming out June 12th, 12th, you said? June 12th, Tasting okay. the Past. Awesome. Science of Flavor and the Search for the Origins of Wine. And you can put it right in front of the cam your camera. There you go. That's it. And uh, you can buy it online, Amazon.com, all the booksellers, uh, major booksellers. Um, where can we find you online beyond uh, finding your book? I'm on Twitter at, at KBegos, and my website's pretty easy to find because there are not many Kevin Begoses, www.kevinbegos.com. Okay. Um, those are the best places, just at KBegos or my website. Perfect. Perfect. That's, That's great, great Kevin. Kevin. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. This has been, been a fascinating. fascinating. We, we could have, have a part two, three. We could have, have a trilogy or more here of this, of this conversation. conversation. Absolutely um, fascinating, fascinating insights and, and, and the history and the lore that, that you've shared. shared. I really, really appreciate you taking the time with us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's been great talking with you. It's you know, a great program. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much Kevin. Kevin. All, All right. right. We'll, we'll say goodbye for now. And folks, stay with me for another few minutes. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Okay, guys, so stay with me because I'm going to announce the winner of last week's contest. Wasn't that fantastic? Wow, what a wealth of information and, and uh, such a great, uh, great guest. We've been really lucky on a great streak these days with lots of great comments. So let me go over to Facebook now, pay attention to you guys again. Yes, Tamara, he is a great Great, great interview. Absolutely. Um, Marie Pierre, will the cost of making wine and distributing be more manageable in the future versus mass producing? You know what? I'm asking Kevin to jump into Facebook after we're, we finish off this uh, discussion and to comment. So stay tuned. Come back or, you know, tonight, tomorrow. Um, because I'm going to to ask him to come back. Linda Alexander, that was really educational. Loved it. Beverly Aslan, thank you, Kevin. And McLean, thank you, Natalie and Kevin, for a wonderful presentation. Excellent. Stephen Andrews, Kevin, thank you for being so curious about ex your experience with wine and taking the time to research and create such a good read. Awesome. Patty Hollander, fascinating. That's great, guys. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Okay, so if you did enjoy it, I know you did, take a moment before we wrap up here to share this video. Even though we're wrapping up, that's okay, because if you share it, people can watch the video replay. And even better, uh, tell folks, your followers, why you enjoyed this video. And if you do, next week we'll be drawing for a um, copy of Kevin's book, Tasting the Past. Of course, tonight, in a few minutes, I'm going to be announcing the winner of last week's um, show. And that'll be three bottles of Sue Ann Staff's wines. Uh, fancy Farm Girl, so based on who shared that. A few other things. Um, next week's guest will be Gina Gallo from the Wine Dynasty in California. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And also in the comments below, I would love to know what was the most interesting thing that you learned tonight. All, some of you are already posting that, uh, but I would love to hear more. Elaine Bruce says, great interview. I was just at Smith Haute Lafitte. Uh, history is amazing, super innovative too, pretty much organic and biodynamic. Anna Paradise, I know you've just joined. Welcome, we're wrapping up, but you can watch the video replay. Uh, Patty and Paul, you got here late, so we'll be back for the replay from the start. I can re re uh, relate to the effects of something. Can't quite read the rest of it. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, and lastly, um, those of you who are members of my Get Wine Smart course, we're heading over to our private Facebook group for a tasting at 7 p.m. of big boned Amarone Italian wines. 
great Father's Day gifts. So join me at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash get wine smart. All right. Can I have a drum roll? <laughs> uh, the winner of last week's um, contest for her share and comments was uh, Maureen, Maureen Condon. Maureen Condon. I'm not sure that she's here live tonight, but Maureen Condon, you got yourself, I think it's three or four bottles of Sue Ann Stass wine. So big thumbs up from Mike Welling. You're welcome, uh, Marie Pierre. Oh, taste of yeast, Paul. Okay, guys. So I am going to wrap this up. Thank you, as always, for spending your Sunday, some of your Sunday evening with me and our great guests. We've got lots more coming up for you in the weeks to follow. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. Take care and bye for now.